Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second seminar in the Modern Money series. Um, this seminar is entitled Governments Are Not Households, Implications of Monetary Sovereignty and Stock Flow Consistent Accounting. So to start off, I want to thank everyone who was able to make it last week. And if you have any questions from last week's seminars, please again feel free to post them on the forum on the website. And all the questions posted on the forum will be forwarded to the speakers. You can also do that for this evening's event as well. So just to briefly introduce our speakers, um, we have Dr. Stephanie Kel Kelton, who is an associate professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute and director of graduate student research at the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability. We also have Mr. Warren Mosler, who is the president of Balance Co. Inc. and senior economic advisor to Senator Ronald E. Russell, the president of the 29th legislator of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And as our, our moderator this evening is Mr. Thomas Edsel, who is a prize-winning journalist, and Joseph Pulitzer II and Edith Pulitzer Moore, professor of journalism at Columbia University. So as far as the format for this evening, um, we're going to let both of our speakers speak and our moderator ask a few questions before you can also ask questions later on. And then after that, if you're following us online, feel free to also tweet at us any questions and put the hashtag MMPP, and we'll make sure to address them at the end of this evening. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Mr. Edsel, who will say some opening remarks. All right, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think we are in for a very interesting evening. Uh, I am not an expert by any stretch of the imagination on this, but from what little I gather, I think we have a truly innovative approach to economics and thinking that runs counter to the way Democrats and Republicans are approaching basic questions of how we spend tax uh, and use money, basically. So with that, let me turn it over to our two speakers. And uh, you'll go first. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, this is Warren uh, Mosler, and go for it. Thank you. Hi, uh, let me give you a little background. I've been in what you might call an insider in monetary operations for 40 years now. I started in banking in 1973. I grew up on the money desk at Bankers Trust in the 70s, back when that was the main dealer operation. I've been trading money, you might say, for, for a long time. I visit the Fed regularly. What I tell you is known by all the senior staffers at the Fed, Treasury. It is not known by the political appointees, the headline members that you'll see at the Federal Open Market Committee and uh, Treasury Secretary, people at that level. The political appointees are the ones that don't understand that the operations people understand everything here implicitly. Uh, also, today I would say it's um, also implicitly understood by trading desks, including uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Nomura, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse. These are all people I've gr grown up with over the years, um, and they understand this and, and know that this is how it works. The last thing I want to say is it's not difficult. If there's anything that appears to be difficult, uh, put your hand up and ask it later. We'll sort it out for you. It's a very simple operation. I'm going to give you, we've simplified the title here to why we have deficits. I'm going to give you one thing to begin thinking about. If you've got a dollar in your pocket, where did it come from? So your first hint is it's signed by the Treasury Secretary. It, unless it's counterfeit, it came from the government. And they've spent it, and they haven't taxed it yet. So what do we call spending without taxing? It's called the deficit. And part of the government deficit winds up as cash is in circulation. Okay. If the government doesn't spend more than it taxes, if it doesn't give you more money than it takes away, you're not going to have it. Okay, so what is casually called the money supply, or part of the money supply, uh, comes from deficit spending. So move right along here. Okay, so what is the monetary system? Okay, the, the monetary system is nothing more than a scorekeeping system. The Federal Reserve is a scorekeeper for the dollar. Okay. It spends 
by changing numbers up in our bank accounts, and it taxes by changing numbers down in our bank accounts. I'll keep up with my, uh, my order here. The Fed doesn't have any dollars or not have any dollars. Now, uh, let, me, let me give you uh, something to think about here. Suppose you went in to pay your federal taxes with some old $20 bills. You went to the Fed, you gave them a stack of $20 bills. They would give you a receipt, thank you very much for paying for Social Security and Afghanistan. And then they throw them in the shredder. And you can buy shredded money in Washington. Okay, there's something different going on when somebody takes your money and shreds it. Okay, clearly they don't need that money to spend. If the banks want $20 bills, they'll give them 20s off the new pile. They don't need your old 20s with germs on them and everything else. They throw those away. If you use uh, if you pay anybody, if you pay me with $20 bills, I'm not going to throw them away. The state of New York's not going to throw them away. Columbia's not going to throw them away. The Federal Reserve is. Okay. Something very different going on there. So let me get a little more specific about how the government actually makes a payment. Let's say it's the beginning of the month and then I'm uh, waiting for my Social Security check. So I look up at my computer screen and I see 4,000. That's the balance of my account, 4,000. I wait and I wait, and all of a sudden, blip, the 4 changes into a 5. What happened? I just got paid. I now have $5,000 in my account. What did they do at the Fed? What did the person do spending the money? He credited my account. He changed the number from a 4 into a 5. He did not take a gold coin and hammer it into his computer. He did not take somebody's tax money and run over to the next room and push it into the wire. He just changed the number up in my account. All federal spending is simply changing numbers up in our bank accounts. The Fed is a scorekeeper. Okay. If we're at a card game and I'm the scorekeeper, how many points do I have? I don't have any points. Well, if you have a hand and you get 100 points and I give you 100, where did they come from? They don't come from anywhere. I just changed the number in your account. Now let's get back to taxes again. We know what happens if you pay your taxes with cash, they just throw it away. Okay. Well, what happens if you pay by check? They change the number down in your bank account. Okay. They don't get anything. There's no gold coin that drops into a bucket. Okay. There's no, they don't take this and do something. And they just change the number down. So if I have $5,000 in my account, I pay a tax of 2000 they just change the 5 into a 3. And now what happens if, like, one person makes a payment to another person? You write a check to pay somebody else. Okay. The Federal Reserve will change the number down in your account, and they'll change the number up in the other person's account. Okay. Totally separate operations. They're the scorekeeper for the dollar. They don't have any dollars. They don't not have any dollars. Okay. Okay. So, as I say here, the monetary system is best thought of as a simple spreadsheet. And in fact, it would only take a couple of thousand dollars worth of software to run the whole Fed. <laughs> All you need is like to get one big giant Excel spreadsheet, put everybody on it, and you're done. Okay? The Fed is tasked to make the debits and the credits as legally instructed. And we're going to get to why we have deficits. That's what we're getting at here. Okay. How banks create deposits and reserves. In the banking system, Loans create deposits. That's how you say it. Loans create deposits. What does that mean? It means if I go in to buy a house, you're just trying to sell your house for, uh, we're in New York, right? <laughs> Better raise the price. Uh, two and a half million dollars. I usually say $250,000. You go to sell your house for two and a half million dollars, and I, I want to borrow the money from a bank to buy it, so I'm going to borrow two and a half million dollars. My credit's pretty good. So what does the bank do? The bank grants me the loan, they approve the loan for two and a half million dollars. And at the and they give what they do is they give put two and a half million dollars into my account, which immediately goes into your account. I don't get to do anything with it except buy your house. Okay. So the two and a half million dollar loan is an asset for the bank. An asset is something the bank has, something it owns. They make a loan, I sign, I promise to pay it back. They have my promise to pay money. That's worth something. That's an asset. Okay. And they put two and a half million dollars in an account, in a checking account. That's a liability, which means the bank promises to pay that money or pay that money. Okay. Notice the loan created the deposit. 
They did not go to the Federal Reserve. They did not go anywhere. The Federal Reserve doesn't even know they did this. The two and a half million then, you sold your house to me, it goes into your account, and let's say we're all at the same bank. Okay. So now the bank has a loan from me. I owe the bank two and a half million, and there's two and a half million dollars in your account. You just sold me your house. You've got the money, I've got the house, the bank has a mortgage. Nobody has gone anywhere near the Federal Reserve. The money was created, the, that deposit was created as a matter of accounting out of thin air. The system's in balance. You have two and a half million in your savings. My savings is negative. I have a loan, I owe two and a half million. Your savings went up, mine went down. The net is zero, that's how they say it. Two and a half million loan, two and a half million deposit. <coughs> Now notice the bank created the money, the, the deposit, but it's not the bank's deposit. It belongs to you. You sold the house. You get to spend it, not the bank. The bank doesn't just take this and go spend it or anything like that. Okay. Um, and, and one more thing happens, which is important to understand the sequence. If the Federal Reserve requires the bank to hold reserves, which and reserves are just checking accounts with the Fed. So if I can call reserves checking accounts with the Fed from now on for this discussion, is that okay? Okay. So if the, if the Fed requires that you have a checking account at the Fed, your bank has a checking account for, and they use 10% because the math is easy, the real number is less than 1%, so we'll say 10%. And I'm supposed to have 200, there's a requirement that I take that 2.5 million, I keep 250,000 at the Fed. As soon as I give you that deposit, my Fed account is now short 250,000. I'm supposed to have it there, but I don't. Okay. What I have is an overdraft at the Fed. My account is lower than it's supposed to be. It's like if you have a minimum balance requirement at your bank and you don't have it, it's below your minimum. Okay. And so what that is, is it is technically called an overdraft loan from the Fed. You don't have, the bank doesn't put that money up. That bank owes the Fed that money. It's an automatic overdraft loan. So what we have in banking, and this is how it works, loans create deposits, and they also create any reserves that the Fed might require. In the first instance, they're simply an overdraft in your Fed account. You're short what you're supposed to have in your Fed account. Okay. Now, the traditional textbook says the Fed gives you money, you make loans, you decide, and it gives you this money multiplier. That is absolutely correct for what's called a fixed exchange rate system which has been gone since 1934, so I'm not even going to talk about it. What we've had for our lifetimes is a system where the loans create the deposits and they create the reserves. And the old fractional reserve banking is perfectly correct. It's just for a different system. They still have it in Hong Kong. They still have it in a couple of other places. But we don't have it here. And none of the other uh, uh, major countries have it. Okay. It all nets to zero. Deposits are necessarily equal to loans. If you've got $100 in a deposit, it's because somebody else borrowed the $100, or you wouldn't have it. There's nowhere else it can come from. Okay. And I'm getting to why we have deficits, by the way. <laughs> but you need to know this. Okay, and the reserves are overdrafts. Okay. So as a matter of accounting, what they, the way they say it is assets equal liabilities, loans equal deposits. They have to because they come from the same place. If they don't, Somebody at the bank has to stay late and figure out why his numbers don't add up. And they will find it, usually, within a few dollars. Okay. And the other way it's said is that liabilities are the accounting record of assets. If you make a loan, the record of that is the deposit. It's the accounting record. It has to add up. Okay. Notice there are no net financial assets when this happened. Well, there are no what we call net financial assets. You can't have everybody with savings. Where would it come from? Savings has to come from somebody else's loan, which is negative savings. You owe that money. So everybody can't have $100,000. Somebody has to be, if somebody's plus 100000 somebody has to be minus 100000 in monetary terms. It can't come from anywhere else. It's called in. The, the textbooks used to call it a case of inside money. The Italians called it giros, you know, in the 12th century. Debits, credits, one comes from the other. It has to net to zero. Okay, okay. so the only way we could have any net savings, where everybody could have some savings, or the savings could be higher than the loans, is if they came from outside the economy. 
has to come from the outside. We can't generate it inside. If you want to say, if somebody gives you money and you want to save it, he would have had to have borrowed it. It has to lower his savings. It can only be transferred around. Net has to come from the outside, and that is the government sector. Okay, and that happens when the government spends more than it taxes. So we have the economy where loans create deposits. One person's savings is another person's loan. The only net savings, the only net dollars, the only net financial assets, all the same thing, can come from the government sector. Now when I talk about the economy, I'm including residents and non-residents. You can live anywhere in the world. I'm not, we can separate it out where people in New York could be saving, and people in Connecticut could be borrowing, and people in Germany could be saving dollars, and people in France could be borrowing dollars. I'm, the whole economy outside of government. Okay. So, we're going to give an example here of how that works. If the government were to spend a billion dollars and not tax it, it does it by crediting somebody's account. It changes a number up. Now the system has a billion dollars more than it had before. It's really that simple. And the way we say it is total net financial assets of the non-government sector are a billion dollars higher than otherwise. Okay? And there's an accounting identity for that. It's called the government deficit equals the non-government surplus to the penny. The government deficit equals the savings in the economy of dollars to the penny. So last year, this year, the government deficit is $1.2 trillion. It spent $1.2 trillion more than a tax. It added $1.2 trillion more to our accounts than it subtracted. When it spends, it adds. When it taxes, it subtracts. Our savings, the whole economy, worldwide, global dollars, went up by exactly $1.2 trillion to the penny or somebody in the general accounting office has to stay late and find his mistake. Because when they change the numbers up, and all the accounts in the world, they have to all add up to the 1.2 trillion, to the government deficit. So why does this matter? Okay. It matters because, in general, the economy has a very strong desire to net save. Why do we have this strong desire to save? It's built into the institutional structure. It's built into the legal structure. We have requirements that will say 15% of your paycheck gets taken away. You never get to spend it. It goes into your pension fund. Okay? We say if you put money in your IRA, you can do that and not pay taxes on it until you take it out. It's a very powerful incentive not to spend your income, to save. And it may not be your savings that you have immediate control, but your business is doing it for you. We have very strong incentives for our corporations to keep very high cash savings. Apple has over $100 billion in their, in their account, okay? Um, and I list some of them here. Pension fund contributions, earnings that our pension funds earn, corporate reserves, IRAs, and all the other savings vehicles. All the cash in circulation, right? And foreign central banks save tremendously. We have central banks, foreign banks, with you know, one, two trillion dollars sitting in their savings accounts at the Federal Reserve. Those are called treasury securities. Treasury securities are just savings accounts at the Federal Reserve, nothing you need to worry about. So we've got all this, all these reasons not to spend into all this institutionally driven desire to net save. Well, how can that happen? We can't possibly borrow enough buying houses and borrow enough buying cars and go into debt enough personally to fill up our pension funds. And so what I'm telling you is, and here's a number here, it's no coincidence that the federal deficit something like 15 trillion, and there's something like 15 trillion dollars in our pension funds. It's like, where else is it gonna come from? Now, this is not to the penny. We could borrow some or not borrow. It changes in different years. But this huge number of 15, maybe be closer to 20 trillion now with the stock market, with a 15 trillion plus in pension funds, has to be, that's a savings, it has to represent somebody else borrowing, spending more than their income, or else it isn't going to be there. Okay, so we've created the need for the government to spend more than its income by establishing all this institutional structure that establishes all these pension funds, automatic contributions, money being taken out of our income and put away. It can't come from anywhere else. 
Think of it as 16 trillion one dollar bills. Where would it come from? The government has to spend it and not tax it, or it can't get in there. Okay. Um, this little chart shows, and Stephanie will talk more about this, how the government deficit equals the savings. And this is just a US domestic private sector, but the rest of the world's pretty flat year to year. So this is a pretty good indication of how the government deficit equals the amount of our total savings. Okay. The other interesting thing is what happens when the government deficit gets very low? We can't save. We have to go into debt to fund our pension funds or else it doesn't happen. We can only go into debt so far before our credit is ruined and the whole thing collapses. When that happens, unemployment checks go up, tax receipts go down, and the deficit goes up automatically, and now we can fund our pension funds again because there's a deficit. So just a little bit of history here. We've had <coughs> only seven periods of budget surpluses. Now, what is a budget surplus? Well, that's when the government taxes more than it spends. It's changing our numbers down more than it's changing them up. It's draining our savings. The same way a deficit adds to savings, surplus takes away our savings. That's just the language we use. We've had seven periods of budget surpluses, and every one, each one was followed by our only seven depressions in US history. And I call this last one a depression because unemployment went up over 10%. That was the old definition of a depression. <coughs> Excuse me. So in what you can see in the, in the late years of the 90s, unfortunately, the surplus was spun politically as the reason for the good years. It wasn't. It was the reason the good years ended. By allowing the budget to go into surplus, all our savings was drained. Uh, based on where a normal deficit would be, we lost on a ground of maybe a trillion dollars worth of savings. It was all taken out. Private sector was going into debt at 7% of GDP, completely unsustainable, and then it all crashed when the next president took over. Unfortunately, the politicians spun it as, oh, the surplus caused the good years. No. The good years, the expansion, because of our tax structure, caused taxes to go up because people were making more money with capital gains and income. Taxes to go up faster than even our government could spend money. And we ran a surplus, drained all the money out of the economy, and it collapsed. The good years caused it. And the tax structure caused a surplus, which ended the good years. It's happened every time. When the surplus ended in 2001, Bloomberg announced this was the longest surplus since 1927 to 1930. Do those dates ring a bell for anybody? Yes. That was our last Great Depression. And we're still fighting. And of course, all our politicians um, think the deficit is, is too large, when in fact it's too small. Okay. So, um, where do all the dollar savings come from? Some other agent spending more than his income. How do you do that? You borrow to buy a house like I did. When older people sell their homes to younger people, the younger people take out mortgages, they borrow the money, they fund the older people's savings. Loans create the deposits. Okay? But we all tend to be net savers. We want to have money in our pension funds. We want to save. And our ability to borrow to do that is limited by income, and it's just impractical. The tax advantages for saving are so strong, they're much stronger than our ability to borrow. Okay. The remaining source of this desired savings is government deficit spending. There's no other place it can come from. And it's no coincidence that the 15 trillion government securities is roughly equal to 15 trillion pension funds. So what's the right size for the government deficit? The right size precisely accommodates the desire to save. Are we ever going to hit exactly the right size? No. Okay. But that would be the right size if we got that exactly right. If we run a deficit that's too large, spend too much and tax too little, okay, we're trying to provide more savings than the economy wants, what happens? All that extra spending drives up prices. It drives unemployment down. Unemployment might go down to 3%, but prices would start going up maybe 10% a month. And, you know, we call that monetary inflation. That's inflation that comes from too much spending. That's what happens if the deficit's too large. Okay. Today's deficit is too small. Okay. 
This is evidenced. Let's see how. I think I said it right the first time here. <laughs> okay, by an economy not spending enough to keep everyone willing and able to work, employed, and producing real output. It's a spending shortfall. This happens, the deficit's too small, the government's, for the size government we have, we're taxing too much, we're taking away too much money, too many dollars, and there's not enough left to keep spending high enough to keep everybody employed. Okay, employment is a function of sales and spending. A restaurant doesn't lay anybody off when it's full, it's when it's empty. An engineering firm doesn't lay anybody off when it's full, when it has no orders. Capitalism is driven by sales. Okay, so. Anyway, we call this the global economy of 2012. Today, the deficit is far too low given, given global savings desire. There's absolutely no question about it. So what's needed? Some combination of a tax cut and or increase in government spending to bring up sales high enough to be able to employ everyone willing and able to work. And so what, the question is, why don't we just do that? And Professor Stephanie Kelton is going to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here this evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure for both of us. Thank you to the organizers as well. We know how much work went into this. So I retitled my talk, um, We Should Be Doing So Much Better. And I hope by the end of Warren's talk and my talk that uh, everyone in the room agrees that not only can we do better, but that we actually should be doing so much better than we are. I'm going to go ahead and, and present the conclusions first, and then I'll go through the talk. Money is no object. We have to overcome this impediment, the belief that the reason that we aren't doing more is because we can't do more. And the reason we can't do more is because we can't afford to do more. We don't have the money. Okay? Money is no object. I think Warren dealt effectively with that already. The budget deficit is not the enemy. China is not our banker. We are not like Greece. We can have full employment and low inflation. Right now, today, and for the last three and a half years, we have been living so far below our means. That's exactly the opposite of what we hear over and over again. We are living beyond our means. We need to tighten our belts. We need to get our fiscal house in order. We're gonna end up like Greeks if we're not careful, right? Look at the graph. If the financial crisis and the ensuing recession hadn't happened, the path that we were on is that red line. That was our real GDP. That's where we were. We got knocked off the red line onto the blue line. And that gap you see, economists refer to it as the GDP gap, it's everything we're foregoing, everything we're giving up by not jumping back on the red line. It amounts to almost $10 billion left on the table every single day in this country. It's waste. Okay, we face a very simple problem. The problem is there isn't enough spending in the economy to employ everyone who wants to work. Simple. And there's only one way out. The only way to grow the economy is to grow spending. Okay, what is the economy? Ask an economist and she'll give you one number. It's your GDP. But what is your GDP? It's the sum total of all the spending in the economy. It's how much you spend buying the newly produced goods and services that are being made by the firms in the economy, right? By the producers in the economy. So where does all that spending come from? GDP. It's how much the household sector spends buying consumption goods durable goods like refrigerators and automobiles, non-durable goods like meals and clothing and so forth, right? Services, vacations and trip to the doctor's office and, and that kind of thing. Consumption spending, spending that you and I do, we account for 70% of all the spending in the economy. We drive this bus, right? 
Investment spending, the spending that by and large is done by the firms in the economy, accounts for another, depending upon where you are in the business cycle, 10, 12, sometimes 14% of total spending, right? That's a big component as well. And then there's government spending, right now picking up about 15, 16% of total GDP. And then there's the spending that the rest of the world does, or that we do on balance with the rest of the world. But it's spending. That's what the economy is. It's driven by, as Warren said, sales. So what drives spending? Income. Income drives spending. And spending creates jobs, right? When you go into a store and you buy something, your spending leads to income to someone else. There's someone on the receiving end. That becomes their income. They turn around and spend a portion of that, right? And this drives the economy, and this is where job growth comes from, growth in the economy. The question today is, who will spend? The household sector, 70% of all the spending in the economy, but it's not strong. It shows periodic signs of life, but it inevitably disappoints at some turn. We're not back in full force, and we're 70% of the economy, but we're still struggling, right? We still have firms laying off massive numbers of workers, right? Some announced just in the last week or so. We have housing prices that are still very depressed, maybe bottoming out, but still very depressed. Lots of wealth was destroyed in the economic downturn. And households are trying to rebuild their wealth. They're trying to pay down debt. They're trying to save more and spend less. And until the household sector finishes doing that, economists use the term deleveraging, until they finish that process and they come back in full force, that huge component of demand is going to remain weak. And if that huge component of demand remains weak, why on earth would businesses go out and hire more workers and buy more capital goods, invest? They won't. They're sitting on the sidelines. They're hesitant about hiring. They're reluctant to invest. They're sitting on $2 trillion in profits, right? When we come back, they'll come back. The foreign sector isn't going to come to our rescue. We're not going to be rescued by strong demand elsewhere in the world. Right? We all know what's been happening in Europe. Even the BRICs are now starting to show signs of crumbling. Right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, those are the places that were supposed to really drive global economic growth. And you're seeing slowdowns in many of these places, recessions, uh, double dip recessions in, in Europe and so forth. This isn't going to pull us out. Well, what does that leave? There's only one sector left, and it's the government sector. But there are so many powerful myths associated with having the government take the wheel for, for a time. Right? The private sector got drunk. We went on a borrowing binge. We spent too much, and now we need to recover. And we need to hand the keys to somebody else. And we've handed the keys. And somebody else needs to drive this bus for a little while. And right now, it can only be the government. Okay? But we hear things like, well, we're out of money, or all of our money comes from China, or we've already spent too much, and now if we aren't careful, we're going to end up like the Greeks. Where do we hear these statements? From the very highest levels. Right? President Obama says, it's a quote, we're out of money. Remember him? <laughs> He really gets this ingrained in the American psyche, this notion that the government ought to run its operations just like a household. It's just bigger, but it's like you and I, right? It should play by the same rules. It should be fiscally responsible. It should not spend more than it makes. If I ran my business the way this government runs this country, I'd be broke and all that. You remember how he used to talk, right? So these are very, very powerful myths that have to be overcome. Households are not like the government. The government is not like a household. They are fundamentally different creatures. A household 
can only spend what it can earn or what it can borrow. It might take on so much debt that it can't pay it back. Either its income doesn't rise fast enough, maybe there's a job loss, income drops to zero, maybe interest rates begin to rise. Households are subject to market discipline. Maybe rates go up, adjustable rate mortgage, all of a sudden you can't pay. Households can't spend more than their income for very long. They can do it. The, the private sector can spend more than its income. Warren explained that. You saw the data, but it can't do it for very long. Households have to live within their means. They're users of the currency. They're users of the currency. This house is different. This house has currency issuing capacity. This house is not revenue constrained. This house always has the ability to pay. This house can afford to buy anything that's for sale in US dollars. This picture has no economic meaning. I want to do an experiment. Okay, this is, my, this is my world now. This is my country. Well, half of you are going to be my country. This is the country of Keltonia. I am the government. I have the taxing authority. I also have a standing army, courts, prisons, and so forth. Half of you are my domestic private sector. You're the households and the businesses in the nation of Keltonia. You're all subject to a tax in this great country. And so, let's say 200 Keltonis. You have to pay me 200 Keltonis this year, okay? What does that mean? If we record this on balance sheets, it means now you're in debt to me, right? I have an accounts receivable, I have taxes due, you have a debt, and I just reduced your net worth. Now. Let's settle the obligation. Go ahead and pay your taxes. Sorry, don't have any Keltonians. You can't. What do you mean you can't? You can't because I haven't spent any Keltonies into existence yet. The money to pay taxes comes from government spending. I'll hire some of you. You'll build roadways for me, and I'll pay you Keltonies then you can pay your taxes. Okay? I'm going to pay 500. Now you're going to pay your taxes. See, I, cr I credited your account. I gave you the 500, but now let's settle up. Taxes are paid. What are your net financial assets? 300 Keltonis. This is a simple, fundamental accounting truth. This is not gimmickry. This is not a theory. This is a matter of accounting. It is a fact, OK? When the government spends more than it takes back in taxes, you end up with the difference. You, the non-government, right? It went somewhere. You got it, right? My deficit is your surplus, or my red ink is your black ink. Why don't you buy some imports? This is the foreign sector. You might decide to spend part of your income buying goods and services produced abroad. You can do that. You can import from them as long as they want Keltonis, which they'll want as long as you produce something of value in your country that they'll want to exchange Keltonis for later, right? So let's say you spend 200 buying great things from the foreign lands. Go ahead. So now where are we? Who's holding Keltonis? We have three sectors, the government sector, the domestic private sector, and the foreign sector, the rest of the world. Where are they? You've got 100. You've got 200. And I'm the source of all that. 
I have the minus 300. My deficit is the non-government surplus, right? The world as a whole is a closed system. Every financial payment comes from somewhere and it goes somewhere. There are flows and there are stocks. Payments accumulate, they pool up. If we stop the clock at any point in time, we can figure out where they are, right? Those blue lines, I don't know how easy they are for you to see, but those blue lines represent leakages. That is the spending of money that doesn't return to the domestic producers in the economy. They don't like that. They want the income to come back to them as revenue. But when you buy from the rest of the world, it doesn't stay here. And when you pay it to me, it doesn't stay here. And when it leaks out in the form of saving, it doesn't stay and circulate here. So all of those types of leakages, buying imports, paying taxes, and saving, have to be offset by different injections into the spending stream, or your economy will contract. If you get more injected in than is leaking out, your economy will grow. But where do those injections come from? One source would be them buying from you. Another source would be me buying from you. And another source would be you investing, borrowing and investing in new plant and equipment. That's investment. So injections, leakages, you have to figure out which one in some total is bigger, and then you can figure out what the impact on the economy is going to be. Government plays an important role both as a source of a leakage and a source of an injection. Right? The U.S. is a net importer. We buy more goods and services from the rest of the world than they buy from us. This results in a trade deficit in the U.S. and a surplus in other countries. This can cause domestic unemployment for you folks, and it can cause the domestic private sector to lose net financial assets. You saw that some of theirs went over there. Unless the government compensates with a deficit, unless it compensates by cutting your taxes or increasing its own spending to replenish whatever might be leaking out to the foreign sector, right? Then we have all these objections we have to deal with, like deficit spending is irresponsible, China won't stand for it, the bond vigilantes will come after us, we'll turn ourselves into Weimar Germany or Zimbabwe, Ah, run for the hills, right? I mean, the hysteria is astounding over the potential for inflation. So let's ask the question on fiscal responsibility. What is fiscal responsibility? Hey, there is a group of folks out there, the deficit hawks, they have their definition of what fiscal responsibility is. For these people, deficits are bad in the short run, in the medium run, in the long run, they are a sign of weakness. You're doing something wrong. You're imprudent if you run a deficit. They want immediate cuts to government spending. They support things like austerity to bring budget deficits down. They'll favor things sometimes, like 100% reserve backing, gold standards, and so forth. They would legislate rules to mandate that the government balance its budget. These are the hawks. Okay, then you have the kinder, gentler fiscal bird, the doves, right? The doves say, well, it's true the deficits are bad, and in the medium term, we do have to work to bring them down, but right now, unemployment is a bigger problem. The economy is not where we want it. So we need to run some deficits in the short run, but we'll make up for it by being good later, and we'll run surpluses, and so over the course of the cycle, it'll all balance out, and we'll have a balanced budget, right? This I find to be perhaps the more frustrating of the two arguments, because this is such a weak sell for me. You know, this is the group that goes out and says, I know I need to go on a diet, but first I'm gonna go out and buy a bigger pair of pants. It just doesn't pass you know, the, the sniff test. It doesn't resonate with people. This group would support things like the fiscal pact in Europe. It says, 
you, you can have small deficits some of the time, but you need to have surpluses the rest of the time, and you need to balance your budget over the course of the cycle. Yes, we need austerity, but not yet, right? We need austerity later. And then there's this other bird, which is the deficit owl, who says, these guys are in the dark. Owls can see in the dark, right? The deficit owl sees things fundamentally differently. Okay, what would the owl say? The owl would never assign an arbitrary limit to either the size or the duration of the government's deficit. They would support austerity only as an anti-inflationary measure. Why would you cut government spending or increase taxes if there's no inflationary pressure and you have lots of people unemployed? That's not the time for austerity. A deficit owl would call it fiscally irresponsible to permit chronic unemployment or high inflation. If you leave here tonight and you take just one thing with you to convince your friends and neighbors, which we hope you will do, take this picture, okay? This is really powerful. I've used this um, over a number of years and I can't tell you the success that I've had because seeing is believing, right? A picture's worth a thousand words and all that. What you see in this picture is, the first of all, you recognize right away that you're looking at a mirror image. You could fold the top half down and it would exactly line up with the bottom half, right? The blue lines, it's not important that you can read every number, just understand that the blue line is the private sector's surplus. That's how much you have. When it's above zero, that's good for you because you have a surplus. When it's below zero, you are in deficit, right? You're spending more than your income. What you see, and this goes back to 1950 or so, is that the private sector lives above the zero line. That's where we are. That's where we operate. That's where we belong. When we have ventured below the zero line, things have gone very badly, okay? The government, the red, lives below the zero line, almost always in deficit. The green is the foreign sector. And there was a time in the US when, when we ran small trade surpluses against the rest of the world, but we haven't done that for decades. Okay, we run trade deficits now, and our deficits are their surpluses. So that green above the zero line, that's theirs, right? That's you spending more buying things from them than they spend buying things from you. If you want to remain in the black above zero and you're gonna have a trade deficit, the only way you stay above zero is if my deficit, the government deficit, is bigger than the deficit you run with the rest of the world. The only way. Okay, so as long as the US has trade deficits, we have to have government deficits or you folks are gonna be in negative territory, okay? All right, China is not our banker. I think Warren already dealt with this um, really effectively. I'm gonna to try to move quickly through this. China ends up holding US dollars because they're net exporters to the US. We buy more from them than they buy from us. We pay them, they have the dollars. And rather than holding those dollars in a checking account at the Fed, China prefers to convert lots of those dollars into bonds. That's part of what we, in daily language, refer to as the national debt. China buys treasury bonds, right? Treasury bonds are functionally savings accounts at the Fed. I could choose to sell you some bonds as well. You can buy these. They pay interest. What you're holding doesn't. Would you like this? Sure. She's no dummy. This is my checking account. It gives me nothing. Give me interest. There we go. Okay. Now she has the bonds. I issued some debt. But this in no way burdens me. And it in no way burdens you or your grandchildren either. Okay. Just listen to Alan Greenspan. So having personal retirement accounts is another way of making uh, future retiree benefits more secure for their retirement. 
And also, do you believe that personal retirement accounts as a component to assist with solvency does help improve solvency? Because when you have a personal retirement account policy, it's a company with a benefit offset. With that feature in place, do you believe that personal retirement accounts can help us achieve solvency for the system and make those future retiree benefits more secure? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the these gold benefits are insecure in the sense that uh, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits employ to purchase? <laughs> So, did you hear what he said? You could not hear. He was asked whether personal savings accounts, personal retirement accounts, would make Social Security safer because it would improve and protect the solvency. Because it's, in Paul Ryan's view, currently not solvent. And Alan Greenspan says, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating all the money it wants and giving it to spending it in some way. Nothing to prevent the federal government from spending all it wants. He says, you don't need personal retirement accounts. There's nothing to prevent the government from making good on every promise it's made to future retirees, the Chinese, whomever. The question is the real resources. Will they be there in the future when we get old and retire and we want to consume things? That's the question that matters. So how does a currency issuer spend? Warren went through this, by directing its bank, usually the central bank, to credit someone's account. Frequently this happens without even writing a check. It's a wire transfer. Okay? In the modern era, government spends by keystrokes. They mark up balance sheets. They use the computer. If you don't believe me, ask Chairman Bernanke. This is the quote Warren referred to. When Bernanke was asked, where did all that money come from? Is that taxpayer money? These are quotes, by the way. Scott Pelley, 60 Minutes. Is that taxpayer money the Fed is spending? And Bernanke says, taxpayer money? No, it's not taxpayer money. When we make a loan, when we spend, we use the computer to mark up someone's account. That's the way it works. Then why can't Greece pay? If governments can always pay. <clears throat> What, what's different? <coughs> Excuse me. The countries in the Eurozone, <coughs> the 17 <coughs> countries, <coughs> oh, really sorry, <coughs> tickle. <coughs> they gave up their currencies. They became users of the currency. They gave up their keyboards. They can't do what they used to be able to do. Notice that Italy's debt to GDP ratio today is not very different from where it was 15 years ago. There was no debt crisis. The difference was all the debt was denominated in lira and they could always pay. Today, all the debt is denominated in euros and the euro doesn't come from Italy. Thank you so much. So every one of these countries that gave up their currencies and adopted a foreign currency have turned themselves into users of the currency and they play by a different set of rules. They're like states in the US. Greece is like Georgia, right? Italy is like Indiana or Iowa. They are constrained by revenue. They can only spend what they can collect in taxes or what they can borrow. The difference is when they go out and borrow, Capital markets, bond markets, know that they're lending to the user of the currency, and they want a premium to compensate for the added risk. They don't do that when they lend to the US, to the UK, to Japan. Okay? Why are rates all so low in all of those countries in spite of the fact that they have, in the case of Japan, more than 200% debt to GDP? Because financial markets can't bully them because they know they can always pay. They can't extract the premium. We are not like Greece. We are not turning into Greece. We are not going to become Greece. And we don't need to beg for help. They have to go strike a deal with Draghi, the ECB president, and they have to promise to behave and 
make concessions and do certain things with their budget policy in order to get the loan. <clears throat> of course, we'll do whatever Congress tells us to do. We don't have to beg. The Fed works for Congress. It's a creature of Congress. You heard Ben Bernanke. We'll do whatever Congress tells us to do. So much for the independent Fed. <laughs> Money matters. Governments should be in control of their keyboards. All those countries in Europe, they gave up their keyboards, and it makes a huge difference. Without the keyboard, without the ability to issue the currency, they lack the power to keep their domestic economies on track. This is a quote from a famous economist who was a contemporary of Keynes's. His name was Abba Lerner. He says, by virtue of its power to create or destroy money by fiat, and its power to take money away from people by taxation, the state is in a position to keep the rate of spending in the economy at the level required to maintain full employment. People say, wait a minute, isn't that the Fed's job? The Fed is supposed to achieve high growth and high employment and price stability. That's what, don't we think of the Fed? As Are we not essentially in a negative real interest rate environment already? Let me, let me just agree with you on the following, that monetary policy is not a panacea. It is not the ideal tool. Did the Federal Reserve Chairman just say monetary policy is not the ideal tool to improve the economy? Yes, he did, because he knows it's true. He knows it's true. It's got to be fiscal policy, and we need the government to do it. We need more spending. It's not going to come from households. It's not going to come from firms, and it's not going to come from the rest of the world. So if it comes at all, it's going to come through a combination of tax cuts, and then we can bring some households along, or government spending. It's got to come from fiscal policy. Okay, But we're so paralyzed by fear of hyperinflating the economy that we tolerate the waste and inefficiency, the loss, the 10 billion that we leave on the table every single day. Okay? An owl would say, you don't need a huge government. It's not the goal is not to have a big government. The goal is to have a fully employed, efficient economy. And that gap in total spending has to be filled by someone or you don't have a fully employed economy. And we have plenty of people who want to work. There's the official unemployment rate, the blue line, and the, um, the uh, enhanced unemployment rate, which includes all the part-timers who really want full-time work and the discouraged workers who stop looking. And if you include those folks, the picture gets a whole lot uglier, right? We have lots of people who want to contribute. Our infrastructure is a catastrophe. The civil uh, engineers do a report card. Our score overall is a D. We need $2.2 trillion of spending just to get us up to snuff. So we have work that needs to be done, and that's just on infrastructure. There aren't nearly enough jobs, and it's not a problem just today. It's a chronic problem in every market economy. They just don't run themselves at full employment. They can get close. And for a period of time uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we got really close, right? But almost always, the number of job seekers is substantially higher than the number of job vacancies, okay? So we have not, not a temporary problem, but a persistent problem that we need to address. We have factories with all kinds of spare capacity today. This is the capacity utilization rate. It goes back to 1965. You can see in the early stages, we ran our factories near 90% capacity. And today, we're well below 80%. There's plenty of slack in the economy. There are plenty of people looking for things to do. And there are plenty of things that need to be done. We can get to full employment. We've done it before. We got as close as we've gotten in decades during the so-called Clinton boom. Right? We had the lowest unemployment, unemployment rate in 30 years. Inflation was dormant, but it was all built on the backs of the private sector. The private sector drove itself into debt on an unprecedented scale. We spent more than our income. That blue line that went way down for the first dip, that was during the so-called Clinton boom. Sometimes economists called it the Goldilocks economy. These were this was the new economy. This was, these were the good times that were going to roll on forever. 
except they couldn't because these folks couldn't spend more than their income year after year after year after year. Eventually, something gives, right? We need the government to take the wheel while the private sector takes a rest. We should be doing so much better. We're not broke. Money is no object. We have the real resources to employ. We can achieve full employment without sparking inflation. How do we know? We did it before. There's an alternative to shared sacrifice, austerity, stagnation, and so forth. The thing that's holding us, us back is our failure to understand how the monetary system works. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. I have a number of questions, but actually one basic one, which is what you suggest seems very attractive and very uh, painless almost. Why doesn't the system do what you say it should do? What, what, is there an economic interest in not doing what you uh, suggest? Is there, what, what is the rationale that, the, that we don't, that the arguments are limited by what you see as the Democratic and Republican positions that are contra contradict? If, if what you were saying is accurate, why not grab it? Well, I think you have to press the button. So I think there are a couple of things going on in that question. I'll answer the part about why economists don't get behind this and leave to policy and politics. Maybe uh, the politician here could handle that side of it. Uh, you know, it, within economics, there is this thing called the Phillips curve, and maybe I can say that in a room like this where so many uh, law students have done economics at some point in their uh, training. But there was this idea for many, many years that there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, and an inverse relationship. So the only way you get lower unemployment is to tolerate higher inflation. And we have these things like the NIRU, the non-accelerating inflationary unemployment rate. These are fancy things economists make up to wow and dazzle one another. We economists used to believe that this um, special unemployment rate was 6%. That if you push the unemployment rate below 6%, inflation begins to increase. Okay, And if you go back and you read the transcripts from the meetings of the Open Market Committee, the Federal Reserve Group that makes the policy, sets interest rate policy, during the Clinton expansion, or the expansion that, that took place under Clinton, uh, if you go back and read those transcripts, you'll find that the members of the Open Market Committee were having these debates. And you had these two different groups. They called themselves the wolves and the owls. The wolves were completely convinced that inflation was right around the corner and that rates needed to go up, interest rates should rise. The elves, Alice Rivlin and some of the others, she was vice chair, she, they said, I think it's possible, and Greenspan agreed, that we can push growth and allow unemployment to go down without inflation becoming a problem. And he was paying attention to the fact that productivity was growing fairly rapidly during that time. So they start talking about, is it possible that the NIRU has fallen? Maybe it's 5%. So they didn't raise interest rates. The economy plugged along. Output increased. Unemployment fell. And inflation remained non-existent. They all started saying, I think the NIRU really did fall. I think it's 5%. And then they had to meet again and decide on interest rates. And they said, I think the, the uh, wolf said, we got to raise rates. Inflation's right around the corner. And the elf said, no, I think we can go lower. And they had this debate. And it's fascinating. And, and then they started saying, is it possible that the NIRU is 4%? Because the unemployment rate fell to 4%. Inflation didn't become a problem. And they thought maybe the number was moving. Um, but the idea that there is still this belief that there's a number out there somewhere and we can't get too close to that number. Now, what they've been doing lately is talking that number up, right? Maybe the NIRU is 8% and this is the new normal and we're just going to have to live with this because if, if we can't really safely go lower. You want to take the rest of it? Can you take it? Yeah. Can you answer the question of why, the, why, why does the system not adopt what you're saying? Yeah. So if we look 
Last year we had the debt ceiling drama. Remember that last summer? And right after the State of the Union, Paul Ryan got up and said, look, the U.S. could be the next Greece. We're going to be on our knees to the IMF. Interest rates are going to spike. We might get downgraded. We might default. We have to take $10 trillion out of the deficit. And we're not going to vote for the debt ceiling increase unless we do that. And Obama actually agreed. The president agreed. He had a plan to take $6 trillion out. But they didn't like what each other was doing. <clears throat> they got right down to the wire. They kicked the can down the road with a compromise. Interest rates had gone up in anticipation of something terrible happening. The stock market was crashing. And we got downgraded by Standard & Poor's. And what happened? Okay, interest rates went down instead of up. Three-month Treasury bills were going through at 0%. You know, everybody's going, like, what's going on? How is this possible? No move on the deficit. We're up over 16 trillion. And, you know, this is supposed to be the end of the world. And then suddenly it's sort of coming out. You had Alan Greenspan come out and said, well, you know, we print our own money. And Warren Buffett came out and said, we're four A's, not three A's, because set the Federal Reserve prints the money. So I compare this to the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans was fought after the war was over. Uh, and the winner, Andrew Jackson, became president for winning this battle after the war was over. Anyway, so what's happened is that moment when they came out and realized that we weren't going to be the next Greece, okay, that the U.S. was not going to be at its knees, that deficits don't drive interest rates up, and there's absolutely no reason to think they would when you understand monetary operations. They never do. The war was over. Okay, we had won the war. We, the reason for deficit reduction was gone. It disappeared. All the reasons that, you know, Ryan and Obama had, all, we've run out of money, all these things were over, okay? But they kept fighting the war anyway. And it's kind of the strangest thing. There's, they just started pushing ahead with, okay, now we got to do it towards the end of the year. And nobody talked about Greece for a while. And then now all of a sudden in the last few months, you're starting to hear Greece sneak into it again. Okay, that war is over. You're right, it should be over. The, the, we know that deficits don't cause any default risk. They don't cause interest rates to go up. They don't cause any of that. Now, they might cause inflation if we overspend. But let me say two things on that. Japan's been trying to inflate with hard as it can for 20 years and hasn't managed to get out of deflation. Okay. The Federal Reserve has been trying to inflate with everything it's got, every trick in the book, every tool it can imagine for four years and hasn't done it. It's failed, utterly failed. It's not that easy. And I've been writing for years, and there's some people here on my mailing list, that central banks cannot cause inflation no matter what they do. And I think we've seen that proven out. Okay, so number one, inflation is not that easy. The, the causes of these other things are all special circumstances of all the hyperinflations. I won't get into that. So, but if there is any reason to think that we do need deficit reduction, that we should cut spending or raise taxes, it has to be inflation, because none of the other things are a factor. So let's look at our inflation forecast. There isn't one analyst out there whose reputation, you know, who has a reputation to defend this, that's forecasting any kind of inflation. The Treasury index bonds, 30 years, are forecasting very, very low inflation. There's not a single inflation forecast out there. So I talked to um, uh, Representative uh, What's his name? Hollings. He's on the Deficit Reduction Committee from Virginia. He's a progressive Democrat. I said, why? Okay, the war's over. Why are you pushing for cuts in Social Security, cuts in Medicare? Isn't the burden of proof on the other side to tell you that we have to cut or else there's going to be inflation? Maybe they have to do a little research and prove to you that there could be inflation and therefore we have to cut Social Security and Medicare? Because there's certainly no forecast out there. Why are you just voluntarily, the left, the progressive Democrats, out there proposing these cuts? Uh, he goes, well, it's a pretty large number, and I think we need to do something about it. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's something very wrong with the political process. And, and I think what's happened is they've become victims of their own propaganda. And they've gotten it so instilled in people that we have to do something about the deficit. They can't even begin to talk otherwise, even though they know the war is over, even though they know they've lost any possible reason for it, even though they know the burden of proof is on the other side now to show that spending needs to be cut or 
taxes need to be raised, whatever, for some, for some reason. It, the polls show that if they come out there, and, and the reactions show that if they come out and aren't for deficit reduction, they get laughed off the stage and they, and they lose their spot. Okay, and, and so they're, this is the, war, the battle of New Orleans being fought after the war is over because people don't realize the war is over. And and so even though the policy members might know that, they're going on dealing with a population that doesn't know it. And it's just an economic disaster and a, and a real tragedy. And uh, let me just say one more thing about taxes, if I can, and, uh, and the size of government, because I want to make this entirely apolitical, which it should be. The size of the government is a political question. How many teachers do we want in the classrooms? How many soldiers do we want in the army? If you take too many, there'll be nobody left to grow the food, and we're going to starve. If you take too few, we're going to lose the war. These are all political decisions of what resources we want move from the private sector to the public sector. And you'll have differences of opinion. Some people think we need more government. Some people think we have less government. But once we've settled politically on the right-sized government, then there is an appropriate level of taxes that allows the right size deficit, so we have the right amount of savings to offset our pension needs and stay at full employment. So given that the size of the government is a political decision that should be based on whether the economy is good or bad, we need a legal system. How many judges and clerks do we need? Well, you know, if there's a 10 year wait, maybe we need more. If they're calling you up asking you to see, why don't you go out and sue somebody? We have people waiting around to try to have trial. Maybe, maybe we've got too many of them in there, right? So you've got to come up with the right size for the legal system and everything else. Once you've done that, taxes are the thermostat on the wall. If, unemployment, if the economy's ice cold and unemployment's high, you're taking too much money out for the size government we have, and you need lower taxes for that size government. If, on the other hand, it's overheating, there's too much spending and prices are going up too fast and unemployment's too low, whatever that means, then taxes have to be raised because for the size government we have, uh, taxes aren't high enough. We're not taking enough money out, okay? So for this right size government, taxes are the thermostat on the wall. It's, they're not there to balance the budget to bring in money. We're just changing numbers down. We're changing numbers up. The deficits are residual. You find out afterwards if it was a right size deficit by counting the bodies in the unemployment line not by worrying about paying it back and becoming Greece and all that nonsense. There is no such thing. Okay, so how, your question now is, why can't the political process get us there? And so I'm, now that you know all this, I'm gonna ask you for the answer on that. Because <laughs> it's becoming more of a mystery every day, because the more people I know, the more people I know who know the right answer, you know, it's almost like the less willing they are. I talked for hours to Senator uh, Blumenthal. He read my book. Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds, you can get it free online, it's an easy read. And he gets the whole thing and he won't do anything. He just sits there. Same with Lieberman from Connecticut. I ran for Senate in Connecticut a couple of years ago. Talked to these people. I talked to Hollins, I've talked to all kinds of people over the years. And uh, they're not going to be the ones, I don't think, to, to move us off the dime on this. We've got the academic community starting to get some of the right answers and through the blogs and Stephanie's done a wonderful job on the blog. I want to promote that for a few minutes if you want blogs to read. I've got mine, MoselaEconomics.com. I forget your, it's a new economic perspective, but what's the? Dot com. Dot com, okay. And, and it's called MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Somebody gave it a name. We don't particularly, it wouldn't be the name we chose, but it's, it's been expanding rapidly. We got a very nice write-up in The Economist early in the year in the Washington Post article was just up there on the screen. Uh, it's certainly mentioned and moved up in discussions, but it's not there. Look, the only thing between us and full employment and prosperity beyond what anyone can imagine is the space between our ears. There's nothing else in the way right now. We're, there's no food shortage. There's no shortage of housing. We have surpluses of everything. Warren, yeah. remember, I won't say who it was, but Warren and I met with a member of Congress together. We went through all of this with this person. And when we got done, this person looked at us and said, no, quote, I can't say that. Not, I don't believe that, I disagree with that, you're wrong, you're crazy. I can't say that. I can't say that. 
right? We have to make it, I think, increasingly safe for these folks to say that, to take these positions. I and mean, wasn't it, yeah. was it FDR who said, I can't do things, you have to make me do things? Yeah, th and this is pro-agenda for all of them. The Republicans would love to cut taxes and not have to, like, cut spending. They would agree to that, but they can't. They, the, uh, you know, they want to cut spending more because they have to balance it. If they cut taxes, they got to cut spending even more. They have to balance the budget, so they don't even do their own tax cuts. The Democrats would like to increase spending. We, we have to, they are, how's our time? You know, the banking thing is another place where these people are completely backwards. Banks are public sector entities. They have federal charters. Okay, they're regulated. The regulators can come in and fire the management. Every loan they make has to fit in a very narrow box determined by Congress. Congress, these are, this, banks are agents of Congress just like the military is. And yes, they have some wiggle room to price risk just like the military has their rules of engagement, okay? And so, but we've got all these Sorry, things. I don't want to cut you off. We go ahead. Have, like, let us some more questions. Oh, go ahead. Let me get some questions from the audience, uh, hopefully, please. Just, just very quickly. So this all can you, this sorry, can you use oh, so. yeah. press the button? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So all this talk about taxing the rich and leaving the poor with less uh, FICA taxes is a moot point. Uh, they really have to say low taxes for everybody. Uh, there's yeah. no problem for any inflation and all that. Yeah. Look, if you want to tax the rich for social engineering, that's fine. But not because you need the money to spend. Okay. These are two different items. If you want to do it on fairness mm -hmm. and whatever, that's fine. But it's not because you need the money to balance the budget. That is not a legitimate reason to do it. Back there. Either one of you, if you guys. Um, okay. So assuming everything you said is right, um, it seems to me that the only risk is inflation. Um, and are there like reliable measures to um, assess inflation, and what would be a tolerable measure? I mean, if you can answer that in this setting. Yeah, you know, and that's a political decision, right? Yeah. yeah, that's a political decision. What the right level is, right? If it's too high and you get thrown out of office, okay, you, you, it was too high. And so, um, and there's there's also a lot more to that, but. The burden of proof should be on whether these policies will cause inflation or not. So if someone wants to come out and say, we have to cut Social Security or else there's going to be inflation, fine. Do the numbers. Do the forecast. There's not a single forecast out there that even looked at it. Nobody's done any of that work. That's what I said to Alan. I said, do, do the work. You know, tell the other side who wants to cut it, the burden of proof is on them to prove that Medicare is inflationary. Right? And if they do, and there's a legitimate political debate that if we don't cut Medicare, inflation's going to go from four to eight, let's put it up for a vote, fine. But they're not doing that. Okay, There's not even any research going into that. All the research goes into how large is the deficit going to be, not whether or not it's going to cause inflation. And if you ask the Federal Reserve, they'll deny it even causes any inflation. Do you have a mic? Press um, the button. To... I think um, um, to my understanding, money is basically a promise that I believe in that somebody will pay me something back when I give him a dollar, which can be enforced easily in your own territory. But is your theory um, not lacking like the one that the, the world has, has to believe you? At some point, if you want to buy oil or minerals and stuff like this, that China or Europe still has to buy it. I mean, Greece, the central problem to my understanding is if they go back to the drachma, they won't be able to buy food anymore because nobody will give it them to them for their own Okay, so look, the, the worst case for any country would be balanced trade. You can always import to the extent of your exports. So what, what you're talking about only matters if you're trying to run a trade deficit where you'd like to be able to import more than you export. And you can only do that if the rest of the world wants to net save your currency. Okay, but no matter what you do, you don't even have to have a currency. You can still export, earn revenues, and then import with those revenues. All right, so worst case is balanced trade for any country, even if you don't have a monetary system. And a monetary system is, of course, never going to make it any worse than that. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that uh, inflation is for special circumstances, but Weimar was a monetary sovereign. Uh, could you comment on what happened there? Well, uh, I'll start and tell me if I miss anything. What you had is you had the Treaty of Versailles, 
which demanded war reparations. And they were spending, I believe the deficit spending was 50% of GDP annually, like 4 or 5% a month. And they were spending it by buying, selling their own currency to buy foreign exchange and gold to make payments. And I will agree that if the United States, how much would that be? If we started spending, you know, a trillion dollars a month to buy gold and to buy euro and yen and everything else and sell dollars, we would drive the dollar down and the price of gold up, much like Germany did. It was extremely uh, special. It was a case of a very special circumstances that was forced uh, by the Allies uh, as war reparations. And the day they stopped that policy, the inflation went back to zero. So that, that was the reaction to a very specific uh, policy. Sure. So if I can just follow up on the previous question. Um, regards to countries that say, even if they ran a balanced trade, wouldn't have enough natural resources to put food on the table, does that mean that you know, you know, the sovereign currency can only really work with the resources they've got in the country and then you know, you've got to go from there? How, how would you do it if you were, say, Nauru, a small country next to Australia that's only got you know, nitrates to sell or something? Is, is it just that money only gives you as much as you've got to work with and just helps organize it better? Is that Okay, so look, the, the, the real wealth of any country is everything you can make yourself domestically at full employment. Think of it as your pile of stuff. Plus everything you can import, minus everything you have to export. And so you're always trying to optimize your real terms of trade, which means import as much as possible, export as little as possible. You want to get the most for your exports. And uh, the way I say it is exports are always real costs and imports are always real benefits. So countries with a lot of natural resources should have a natural advantage because they can export these things and import a lot. And they're just starting ahead of the game. Right? And so uh, most of the world now import, you know, services are a big aspect of that. And you have all kinds of communication so you can export services to pay for your imports if you need to. But I, you'd be hard pressed to come up with any country that's having a problem importing. Even the worst countries in the world are, are the weakest. When they send the IMF in, the problem is their imports are higher than their exports, right? They have a trade deficit. Okay? So even those countries manage to do it. Why? The rest of the world wants to export, wants to sell you things. They're controlled by their exporters. It's not in their macro interest, macroeconomic interest of those countries but it's in the micro interests of their exporters. And, and I've yet to see even the weakest countries faced with a problem where they they have insufficient imports. Now, I'm not saying it isn't theoretically possible and we could cross that bridge when we come to it, but I just, I've just never seen it. Back there. Um, you, you keep seeing, seeming to make the assumption that anyone who wants to work and is willing to work is a positive gain for society in terms of productivity. I, 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 can, I can't see why full employment is a proxy for full out, uh, for maximum output. There are there might be someone who is a negative uh, burden on society in that in, in terms of output. There might be someone who's not able, uh, uh, might be willing, not able, or might be willing and able but not able to do anything productive. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know what, we're defining willing and able is what you're doing. And if you have people who, when they go to work, they just break everything, and, <laughs> you know, get in fights and throw things around, yes, that's going to be an issue. But, I, you know, that's, we're so far from that right now where, um, you know, that would be a problem. But in general, a person employed is certainly, you know, you know less of a problem, <laughs> less of a negative than unemployed. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, considering that the private market is not able to hire, not not willing to hire them right now, it means the private markets essentially say they are ne negative to me. Yeah, no, the, no it means that sales aren't high enough. If their sales doubled, they would hire more people. Sure, but you're making an assumption that full productivity implies higher sales necessarily for them, or higher sales that or higher profits for them that would enable them to hire more people. Yeah, not every industry, but if you've got. Um, you know, with increasing sales, if you look at any any graph of sales and employment, it's always the same line, right? You have productivity in there, but you've got sales and employment. And, and capitalism is driven by being able to sell the output. 
at a, at a, at a price. If, if okay. you hold firms, if you ask firms, what is the biggest thing holding you back right now in terms of hiring? It's sales. It's the number one answer every single time. Okay, regulation comes up, taxes come up, but sales is number one. Yeah. And, and look, you know, we could we could agree that at some level of sales, you're going to get some level of unemployment, maybe three percent or something, four percent. And if you try and go lower than that, you may wind up in some kind of a negative situation. We, we've never hit that, but I can understand the theory that there might be, you start hitting the transitional unemployment levels, that type of thing can happen. Now, um, if we have more time, we can also go into the value. See, see I, I had three proposals. And the first was to just suspend FICA taxes in this economy so that people working for a living will increase their incomes by $300 a month. They can make their mortgage payments, which fixes the bank. They can, sales will increase, and employment will increase. But the problem is, the, the, a key part to the proposal was that the, the U.S. government needs to offer a job, and right now I'd say a $10 an hour job, to anybody willing and able to work as a transition job. Because the private sector doesn't like to hire people who are unemployed. There's a, there's a resistance to that. And as the economy picks up, those people never come in and you wind up with labor bottlenecks you won't otherwise have, labor shortages you won't otherwise have. But if they're in a transition job, then they get hired. Now, uh, our, the paper I wrote on this was called uh, Full Employment and Price Stability back in the 90s, and Argentina actually did it. Daniel Cosa was at the Labor Ministry, and in 2001, after they went down in flames with 32 dead in the street, they reopened with this program called the Jefe's program where they offered a a very low wage job, but to any head of household willing to work. And they got two million people into this program. Uh, the population was only like 35 million. It was a huge amount. They were all people who had never held a private sector job before. Within two years, a million of them had been hired into the private sector. And at that time, Argentina had the strongest economy in the world with like 9% growth rates. Okay, And uh, the, the point being that it's this transition job, if the U.S. did it for $10 an hour, it's, a, it's not very much money. It's not a financial issue. It's an issue of being able to allow people to transition from private sec from public sector to private sector work. And the unemployed are in the public sector, whether you say they are or not. Uh, Start and chatter people do the same thing. What's that? Start and chatter people do the same thing. Yeah, now India has something called the Rural Poor Program. It's doing really badly. Yeah, well, that's because the corruption is doing badly. No, it's also because governments are inept at running it. There, there yeah, is, that's what I said, <laughs> the corruption. <laughs> These people have to pay for their jobs, for their government jobs. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, could you talk us through the Volcker period? And, and if I understand you correctly, yeah. there's no reason for Volcker to do what he did. Yeah, I, I, to me, I, I lived through that period. I was on the trading desk, and that was like, uh, who was asking that question? Uh, John. But that's your point. Yeah. Uh, to me, that was like absolute disgrace. We had a Fed chairman who did understand monetary operations. He set a limit on um, borrowed reserves at like 50 billion. He said the banks can't have any more money than that. No. Okay, well, banks make loans which create deposits, and then two weeks later, they settle up. And were you there then, sir? At Blair? <laughs> no. It was, it was terrible. And, so what he did was he transferred interest rate control to the New York Fed from the Washington Fed, you know, by default. So, it, but, so the way it happens is, so the banks would add up their deposits, and suddenly they, instead of 50 billion in reserves, they need 55. And the New York Fed's supposed to say you can't have Well, the loans and deposits have already been made. They already have an overdraft with the Fed. An overdraft already is a loan. So all they could do is go out and try and borrow it from each other and drive up the interest rate. And then they'd come to the discount window, you know, asking for the money. And the Fed would slam the window on their fingers and they'd come up with the bleeding stubs and ask again. And what they did is they just bid funds with each other up. And I remember one Wednesday, funds were 28 bid, no offer, 28% bid, no offer. And then the thing would expire and at the end of the day, the Fed would lend the $5 billion because it can't come for anywhere else. And it would be some interest rate, the discount rate, plus the stigma for having your bank taking the money instead of somebody else. So the interest rate plus getting your fingers chopped off, I, I think the discount rate was 14 or 
and then rather than get your fingers chopped off at the window, they say, oh, you need to borrow, well, maybe we need to send some examiners in. All right, I'll pay Citibank 25%, let them go to the window. And Citibank would pay the next guy 26, let them go to the window. And they, they bid it up to say, hey, for 28%, I'll go to the window and get my fingers chopped off and get the examiners in. So it was, it was a horrible thing. And you saw interest rates fluctuating 10 full percentage points on a daily and a weekly basis. It'd be 60, then it'd be 20, then it'd be 28, then it'd be, and, you know, markets were, and it was an absurdity. After a year of this, uh, Volcker finally realized that it made no sense, and all he had done was transfer control to the New York Fed and use this stigma as a way to drive a spread between the discount rate <coughs> and the actual rate. And it made inflation worse. Okay, if you want to look what broke the inflation in 1980, it was not the Fed. It was deregulating natural gas in 1978, which Jimmy Carter did, and he still gets no credit for having done that. He probably didn't know what he did. But what happened is natural gas had been capped at, I think, 30 cents, and so nobody would let it eat out. So he deregulated it, and the price went up to 260, which was a huge embarrassment. It came down a little bit, but it was far cheaper than oil. And all the utilities switched from burning oil to natural gas in huge amounts. OPEC cut production to try and keep the price of oil above 30. They cut production by 15 million barrels a day, and it wasn't enough. They drowned in their own oil as everyone stopped using it. We had a 15 million barrel a day plus supply shift, supply shock, positive supply shock. And the price went down to 10. That should have brought prices way down. Today, you know, when oil drops, we see negative CPI. Not with 20% interest rates, because interest rates get into the cost of everything. And they, people with money in the bank, you're compounding on all your savings. So you have all this, the government's a net payer of interest. It kept demand high. It kept costs high. Cost of investment was high. Prices had to be higher before you'd invest because you have to pay 20% for money. And so the inflation lingered on because of Volcker, not, you know, in its high interest rates. And uh, what, what was that paper you wrote about? How high interest rates cause inflation when debt and so GDP ratios were high. Yeah. And, and it's, held, it's held absolutely true mm -hmm. where because governments are net payers of interest, when you raise rates, you're actually pouring more dollars into the economy and making inflation worse. When you lower rates, you're actually reducing inflation. The Fed did quantitative easing. They bought all these securities. They earned the interest on the securities. If you look for the last couple of years, <coughs> at the end of the year, the Fed's been turning $80 billion a year over to the Treasury. Where do you think that came from? That would have been earned by the economy, the private sector, if the Fed hadn't turned had not owned those securities. The quantitative easing has been draining $80 billion a year on the economy. It's been making it worse. Okay? And so what do they do? They do more of it. Now they're draining like $100, $110 billion a year out of the economy with the new round of quantitative easing. They think they have their foot on the gas. They've got it on the brake. But when it doesn't make the car go faster, they just push it hard, push the brake harder, and slow it down some more. I just, just, I just put up the quote from FDR's Fed chief. Yeah. Eccles, yeah. is that how you say his name? Eccles, yeah. Eccles. Yeah. He's saying clearly the best way to stimulate the economy is through tax cuts. He liked the payroll tax cuts. And the best way to fight inflation is through tax increases. So here's the Fed chairman saying you control inflationary pressure through fiscal policy, not monetary policy. Yeah, if you read, if you read him, he, he knew what was going on. You've had over the years various guy named Rummel knew what was going on, the Eccles in there. You know, if you go back through time, but it gets quickly forgotten. It doesn't seem to get into the common knowledge. Whatever. Right, sir. Here. Um, one thing that I felt uh, was missing, uh, or not uh, talked about today, was uh, the effects on foreign exchange. Um, you know, our countries don't live in a vacuum anymore. Uh, you know, there's a lot of trade going on. Um, and, you know, we, yes, we don't live in a gold standard anymore. We don't have fixed exchange rates, and, you know, the Weimar Republic can't happen again because we, you know, unlike said in our states and so But we do have this, you know, Bretton Woods too, maybe some people call it, and you know, some countries do have their exchange rates to America, others have a, a peg that's not really a peg by each time. Um, so let's say that America does, you know, implement some of these policies and uh, you know does quantitative easing in in you know in spice and or um, I actually haven't heard any particular prescriptions, but let's say something does happen in that regard. Uh, would there be uh, significant effects on foreign exchange regime, given America's leadership in that regard, uh, and would that be detrimental to domestically or internationally? Um, so, uh, yeah. 
Well, look, you have to remember that exports are costs and imports are benefits, right? The rest of the world wants to export to us. Well, let them do it. They're just making themselves the world's slaves, right? They're producing. If you look at Japan, right, for an example, if General MacArthur had gone into Japan right after World War II, and he said, uh, okay, we won the war. We've got more nuclear weapons here. Here's the deal. You're going to send us two million cars a year for the next 60 years. We're not going to send you anything. You know, and, oh, we, everybody would have said, you can't do that to those poor people. You know, it's like outrageous. Well, what's been happening for the last 60 years? Japan's been sending us two million cars a year. We've been sending them nothing. This is the biggest case of war reparations in the history of the world. But they think they're winning, and we think we're losing. We send trade negotiators to try and stop it. Right? <laughs> the thing is, if you, once you understand, and so, so we've had like three, four generations of Japanese working 12 hours a day at their machines, building us cars and golf clubs, and living in 600 square feet, and, you know, saving hot water when they make tea for later so that we can sit around on welfare, driving the cars and playing golf. Right? And they think they're winning, and we think we're losing. The, the idea is you want to optimize your real terms of trade, as all good Australians know. Or you want to be able to get the most imports for your exports. Okay, and if the rest of the world wants to export to us, and China, China's been you know, the world's slaves for the last few years. They've been net exporting large amounts. We've been giving them numbers on the scoreboard at the Federal Reserve, right? And our real terms of trade have been much higher than otherwise. We need to just take advantage of that. Just open it up. If you want to send us things, fine. Now, what happens is... I, I was more so going to the... Yeah, like you said, in terms of trade, but it would, in the, you know... If uh, China's currency... You're worried about the exchange rate? Well, I'm talking okay. about because so many countries tie their currency with America and so many countries yeah, well, look at... Well, yeah. um, that's for the purpose of exporting us. I understand, but then the you know that peg may not be sustainable for the long term, given. Yeah, you know, and so they might not want to export to us anymore. Well, yeah. uh, uh, in terms of okay, well, in a very practical term, let's say uh, a dollar in America will buy less over the long term if yeah. you know the America's currency keeps on appreciating. So you know that also has a you know that uh, you know the policies that we're talking about right now also can you know diminish your purchasing power may perhaps not. In domestically, but internationally, you know, things would not be as cheap. I probably not be as cheap anymore because, you know, in relative terms, uh, you know, are there maybe uh, hours worth of labor and there maybe is not, but not have the same, you know what I mean? Like yeah, so we might price. not be able to import as much. The, the risk yeah, is that our ability to import goes away. Uh, or more so, you know, in as a person, your hour of labor lies less in international terms. Yeah, that's, that means we can import less. Yes. <laughs> so we're, we're agreed then. We're That's all the risk. Okay. Yeah, so the risk is that imports yeah. go away. So we should have trade policies and fiscal policy to maximize our real wealth, make our pile as large as possible. Everything we can produce at full employment, plus what we can get from the rest of the world, minus what we have to send out. So once you've optimized that, look, it's not what one dollar buys, it's what all the dollars buy. Sure, one dollar buys a lot less than it did 100 years ago, but all the dollars buy a lot more. And that's what we all have, and that's our real standard of living. But we're not talking about, we don't want dollars, we want the goods. We're talking about right. goods, right? We're not, like, right. you know, we have a good trillion yeah. dollars, Ex but then exactly we'll my have point. what we have. So uh, I guess um, there's something else to keep in mind is that we're looking at, we should be looking at real terms, right? We in real terms, we want to. You know, so that, that supply is massive, because they you know, Yeah, our real skin. produce more, and that's something else we're thinking about, like in terms of intergenerational effects. Uh, when uh, the, oh, the baby boomers start to retire, we have less work, people working, so there will be, you know, a strain, a productivity strain. We need to produce more, give more services to this for the people that aren't working. And then, you know, no amount, no amount of, you know, quantity is easy or the, you know, the, the enabling will ease that tension because yeah. no, we need, will need more people. No, you need real output. Sure. Yeah, so. Yeah, and so you want to optimize real output. So how do you do that? Well, you start by having everybody working. That's true. You know, you know, taking yourself down to like 10% unemployment because you think you need the money in the future makes no sense at all. It's not about that. It's exactly what you said. You yeah. need the real output. It doesn't make sense to stop using unemployment to fight inflation and start using unemployment to protect the exchange rate. <laughs> You're here. Um, can you comment on uh, the dollar 
as the reserve currency and how that uh, as a reserve currency as the reserve currency and how that ties into uh, modern monetary. Well, it, look again, it's all about being able to uh, optimize your real terms of trade. And what does a reserve currency mean anyway? All it means is that other countries are holding it as foreign exchange reserves. Why are they doing that? To be able to drive exports to the U.S., which is to our advantage. Okay, and we can use our taxes to make sure we can have enough spending power here to buy everything we can buy at full employment, plus what everything the rest of the world wants to send us. We did that in the year 1999, where we had unemployment under 4%, and we had record imports, even larger, there were 385 billion back then, back when that was a lot of money. Well, I guess what my question is, uh, the trend towards discussions that there should be a basket of reserve currencies, uh, China's coming if to they want to do that, trades with renminbi yeah. as a currency of trade for oil. Yeah. The only way that matters to us is if it means we no longer have the ability to import as much. Okay, if our real terms of trade deteriorate. And right now, the rest of the world is begging us to take more of their stuff, not less. China protests when we put a duty on tires, because they want us to have more tires, not fewer tires, right? And, and all, how many countries in the world are coming after us because our trade, is, our markets aren't open to them, which means they want to export more to us. So right now, it's going the other way. They want to send us things. We just need to get out of the way and let them do it. And the currencies will figure it out. Our, our real prosperity, our real terms of trade, if we just get out of the way of blocking it, we'll, we'll, we'll have an era of prosperity no one could possibly imagine. Yeah, full right. employment, and we're open to the imports from the rest of the world. They'd like nothing better to do that right now. Now, if I were them, I wouldn't be doing it, but that's what they want to do. And it's to our advantage. Over here. Um, you made a comment earlier on about Australians. Well, where, where I come from, uh, uh, we've been told that uh, the wealth of our country has been built on the mining boom. In other words, we have something that the rest of the world wants. Uh, and from what you're saying, it seems really like the, uh, the wealth of the country is the combination of what you can perhaps sell to the rest of the world, the productivity of your own citizens, the yep. wealth can be built around all of that. What I'm wondering is, uh, how it, it, take a very poor African country in the sub-Saharan belt that has not much, but it has people who would like it. Yeah. It has a government with a fiat currency. How does it use these theories to build its own wealth? Well, they could immediately go to full employment and have a very nice place to live. Whatever resources they have, they have a lot more than ancient Athens did. <laughs> they did all right. Built a nice place. Some of those buildings are still there. Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was a nice place. <laughs> no IMF, no World Bank, no electricity, no bulldozers. Capital goods seem to flow in even to the poorest places, right? So, you know, at a minimum, with everybody working, and look, the difference is when you, Japan has no resources, right? And the difference is when people get up in the morning, do they spend their time piling up rocks or throwing them at each other? And if you can organize your country with full employment where they're piling up the rocks instead of throwing them through each other's windows, then you come up with like one of the nicer places in the world to live, even without all the resources someone else might have that are largely frivolous anyway, right? Okay, I have some questions from people online, so if you have to bear with me, I've got a few. So the first one is, uh, how does MMTV the inflation problem called by over-financialization? Uh, speculation, things like that. So, do you have any solutions for dealing with that so that it doesn't get in the way of, you know, getting to full employment? No, well, I was going to grab a graph. Okay. See if I can well, look, it's you, important. You can, you can always sustain full employment, and normally, what we call inflation are localized problems. Mm -hmm. It might be uh, the Saudis raising price because you know they're the price setter at the margin, or it may be um, some real estate speculation or something like that. And, and these booms are never a problem until they reverse. In 2008, if we had immediately had a uh, full payroll tax holiday, FICA suspension halfway through 2008, and unemployment never got above 5.5%, we wouldn't still be talking about the financial crisis. The problem was we did not make a fiscal adjustment, and we let the financial sector problems spill over into the real economy, which is a complete disgrace. We should never have let that happen. And if you look at the crash of 87, when the stock market crashed, unemployment did go up. And that's been largely forgotten. 
And so it's when we let the financial sector problems take away the aggregate demand that causes unemployment, and that's when we have the memorable crises and the problems. When we lose the alternative to make money investing in the real economy, and all people are left with is the, the financial system. I mean, I just threw up the graph that I sent to yeah. you, and I think you put it on your blog uh, yeah. the other day, but you know, there's a very strong correlation between inflation rates globally and commodity prices. Yeah, they mostly they, come through the cost of it. Yeah, but, but it doesn't come from economies trying to run their economies at full employment. It doesn't come from right. doing the kinds of things we've been talking about today, right? getting to full employment, largely so, on the supply side. They're on the cost side. So, so you were talking earlier about you know, dividing the, the issue of taxation to a wealth redistribution. Is it possible that you know something like a financial services tax or something could actually have a productivity gain, but not necessarily from the redistributed side, just to sort of reorient the yeah. investment towards uh, sort of real yeah. production you, investment. You wouldn't do it to raise revenues. You would do it to slow down financial transactions because you thought they were a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I guess the next question is, do you have an, uh, sort of just some ideas about what bottlenecks cause high inflation and how we can overcome those? I mean, we already talked about finance, but other, other ones, things like oil, you know, is there a way that MMT can address those things so that we don't hit, you know, localized inflation problems that then people think are larger inflation problems? Well, most commodities, globally are done with long-term contracts. So if you can build a power plant that runs on coal, you'll talk to Montana and get into a 30 or 50 year contract for coal to be a power plant. China goes to Argentina to talk about long-term beef purchases where they'll go out on the horses and look at 50 million acres of land or something and determine that they can get into some 30 or 50 year contract for food. The, the one commodity we don't do that with is oil, right? We just price that in the spot market every day and let it fluctuate up and down. The U.S. could enter into a long-term contract with Canada and Mexico at a fixed price with some kind of a modest adjustments for this or that. And let's say it would be $100 a barrel or $120, as a price that makes sense for Canada to do its investment, Mexico to do its investment. We would then have a stable price for the next 20 or 30 years of that commodity, and it would be a disruptive factor. And that would be the normal type of thing you would do in the commodities markets. You don't trade, you don't leverage the whole world, your whole economy to the spot market in, your, in a vital uh, commodity like that. But there is no movement in that direction. And so if you're going to let all these things take place in the spot market, you're going to have problems. Same thing with agriculture. You leave that to the spot market, you're going to have problems. And we, we see that over and over again. Historically, there have been buffer stock policies for agriculture. For, for good reasons. Public purpose is served by that. Um, so another question is, uh, a lot of people who talk about endogenous money, this idea that different types of debts get created within the private sector, and you were talking about the Federal Reserve having to accommodate that. Um, if, if that means the government can't necessarily control the overall supply, is it more an issue of whether or not we're having private debt, or as Randy Gray said in the first seminar, public debt as the basis for the growth of the money supply? You know, if you don't know anything except the, the, the number of people in the unemployment line, you can make your appropriate fiscal adjustment. And if somebody says, gee, well, private sector debt was higher. Private sector, oh, what's the difference? You know, you got your taxes. Unemployment's starting to go up. You lower it. In 2008, we could see that coming. Unemployment was starting to go up. We were, sales had plummeted. Car sales went from 17 million to 9 million. Clearly, the economy doesn't have enough money to spend because sales are going down for whatever reason. Okay, subprime, this, that. Could be anything. You stop taking FICA taxes out of people who are working for a living, out of their pockets, who've been underperforming for 40 years on real wages, by the way. So it's not like they're not deserving. They're actually doing the real work. And it's a regressive punishing tax again that shouldn't be allowed to stand anyway. But anyway, you eliminate that. Their average family's income is up by 600 something dollars a month take home. And suddenly car sales get back to normal levels and home sales and people can make their mortgage payments. And you, know, you don't need to know much else except what's happened to sales, what's happened to employment. You can let the, you figure out the reasons later and maybe do something so you don't have that kind of emergency happen again, but you don't need to let it create an economic disaster for the population. Um, so one thing I know you guys haven't necessarily talked about that much today, but we're going to talk about later in the series a bit more, particularly in the eighth event on economic rights, is this idea of a job guarantee, publicly employed or right, the, in conjunction with, with the government, sort of through nonprofits and entrepreneurs and things like that, um, do you think that's sort of going towards a like a labor standard, you know, instead of a gold standard? So the value of the dollar becomes fixed around whatever the kind of average unskilled labor person, you know, can work in an hour. 
So every, every currency uses a buffer stock policy of one kind or another. The gold standard was a buffer stock policy. I'll buy or sell gold at $35 an ounce. Today, we have an unemployed buffer stock. When things get too hot, we do try and make policy so that unemployment goes up to cool them down. And then we try and, uh, when things are too cold, we try and do things to bring unemployment low. So our buffer stock are unemployed. We have a buffer stock of unemployed labor. The job guarantee, the transition job I was talking about, is proposed on the principle that an employed buffer stock is a much more efficient buffer stock. It's a much more effective buffer stock than an unemployed buffer stock. You want to keep, a buffer stock has to be fluid. It has to be able to be bought and sold. Your, your labor buffer stock has to be able to be hired. It has to be employable or it doesn't do you any good. If you have a wool buffer stock like Australia used to have, and you let the wool go bad, well, when the price goes up, you can't sell it back into the market. You have to keep the wool good. If you have a butter, like these down, you got to keep it cool. And you can't let it get rancid. Okay? If you have a labor buffer stock like we do, the only way it's going to be an effective price anchor on the system is if these people can be readily hired by the private sector. So you have to, by keeping it employed, you're keeping your buffer stock healthy, you know, wealthy and wise, so to speak, and, and there to be an effective uh, buffer stock and not letting it go bad. So the, we're using the worst possible buffer stock now, which is an unemployed buffer stock. Uh, people depreciate when they're unemployed, for lack of a better word. And it's, you know, no public purpose is served by that. There's no cost to keeping it employed. When it's employed, it may even be producing useful output. Certainly it's going to be healthier, you're going to have better family situations, you're going to be more employable, as Argentina showed was the case. You want to have something like that? Well, no, I think you're completely okay, covered it. Let's see if there are another questions. Um, yeah, I've just got one more, which is, you know, people often say governments, it plays isn't to get involved in the economy. You should sort of just set the rules and step back. I mean, it seems like this idea of when, when you're the one setting up the money, when you're the one essentially putting the electrical power in, you can't, you can't have that system. You can't just sort of set it up and set yeah. it back without taking some action. Okay, so, so government has to provision itself. And, and everybody, even the libertarians, will say you need a legal system, you need military, you need some basic things. Right. So how does government provision itself? Well, in the old days, you just conquer somebody and take slaves, and then you'd have them do all the public works, right? And then the British were a little more sophisticated. You'd wake up in the British Navy with a big lump in your head because they hit you over the head last night in a bar when you were drinking, they pressed you into the Navy. Okay, that's another way to provision the public sector. Uh, we pretend to be more civilized. We have the monetary system. So what we did, like Stephanie did, was we pose a tax on everybody in something they don't have, and with the penalty, you know, if you don't pay your tax, right? And then, how do you get the money to pay the tax? Well, you gotta come work for the government. So we use the monetary system by first imposing a tax for the purpose of moving resources into the public sector. So we impose a tax, and then we give people a way to earn the money to pay the tax, we hire them into the uh, public sector. So the first thing the tax does is causes unemployment. There is no unemployment in this room right now. But if I take out, I, I use my business cards, and I say, okay. See this card, this is my business card. Does anybody want to buy one for $100? No. Does anybody want to stay and work in the public sector here and clean up this carpet afterwards? I'll give you one of these, no. But this is just a piece of paper. But then I say, oh, there's a guy at the door who works for me. It's got a nine millimeter. You cannot get out of here without one of these cards. Right. Now you are all unemployed. You weren't unemployed before. You, you weren't looking for a job that paid. Unemployment is looking for a job that paid to buy cards. You were not unemployed. But now you are looking for a job to earn these cards because you need them to pay the tax to get out of the room. So the first thing the tax does is create unemployment. And then the government hires everybody to do the job of wanting. It hires all the unemployed that it created with its tax. So what sense does it make to unemploy more people than you need to hire? It doesn't. The tax should never unemploy more people than you want to hire. And so here's government using the monetary system to provision itself. It's only provisioning itself to the extent that the politics want to provision. This many soldiers, this many legal system, whatever, build the roads, build the schools, don't build the schools, private schools, public schools, figure it out, figure out how the 
you know, the politicians want the government, the political process, what size government you want, and then you impose a tax to unemploy the amount of people that you want to provision that government and no more. And that will invariably be a tax that's smaller than the spending. You're invariably going to be able to tax less than you want to spend because there's a need to save, particularly when you legislate pension funds, tax advantages for not spending your income. Just two more. Um, the first one is, what does this have to do with debt-to-GDP ratios? Is there an optimal ratio? Does it even matter? The optimal ratio is the one that results in full employment. It's a residual. And the, the, the second question is, what happens when OPEC no longer accepts US dollars for oil? Is there an issue? Well, you know, so they're not like only demanding dollars now. They'll take anything. The question is, you know, let's say they decided they would only accept paper clips. <laughs> for oil. Well, then we'd all be like uh, running out trying to get paper clips and paper. Now, what are they going to do with the paper clips? Well, if they're going to exchange them back into different currencies, it's just a numeraire. I guess the answer is the currency they want is just a numeraire. What's important is the currency they save in, it's the currency they want to accumulate. Anything else, there's foreign exchange markets, it's, it, it doesn't matter. And, um, you know, you, you'll hear that. Uh, countries, didn't did Iran or somebody stop accepting dollars or something for oil? It doesn't make any difference. Uh, China has just switched to yuan for, for some of the things they're doing. It doesn't make any difference. It's just a numeraire. The only thing that matters uh, is, is what currency you want to accumulate. It. And the only way you can accumulate a currency is to uh, net export to that place. So if you want to accumulate dollars, you've got to sell oil to the U.S. to get the dollars. If you want to accumulate euro, you've got to sell oil to Europe to get the euro. Yeah, I just got one, sorry, one last quick, and this is a bit more of a, a sort of educational question. A lot of the sectoral balances looking at the government, the private sector, the external sector, uh, the language often conflates the federal government, the state and local governments into yeah. the government sector, but only one of those is a currency sovereign. So there is a distinction within that, that that's related to what you're saying. Is that just a... Yeah, you know, you can start with just, um, you can start with no sectors, right? You can see what happened. It, it, you divide into sectors for like purposes of analysis. What is the purpose of the analysis? To identify one thing or another, right? So we know that only the federal government can act counter-cyclically. The private sector is always what's called pro-cyclical. But when things are getting bad, the private sector has to cut back. When things are going good, the private sector gets ahead of itself. We, we know that. Only the government sector can go in the opposite direction because it's not constrained by revenues. It's spending just by changing numbers. It's not spending its income. So in a downturn like we have now, you can't expect the private sector credit to suddenly expand out of nowhere because income's going down, asset values are going down, creditworthiness is going down. You're not going to see a credit expansion in the private sector. You're not going to see the states engaging in any kind of credit expansion, even though they may be legally allowed to but they're still limited by their incomes and, and whatnot. Uh, so we know that only the government can either lower taxes to get more private sector spending or increase government to have more public sector spending, again, depending on your politics. So yes, for purposes of analysis, you can include the states, not include the states. It all depends on what your further purpose of the analysis is. Tax, taxes reduce net financial assets to the domestic private sector, whether it's Federal the, taxes, yeah. And perhaps state taxes. Sure. And if, you know, if Apple raises their prices and has more cash pile up, they're reducing everybody else's net financial assets also. So but any one entity... states have balanced budget. Yeah. Requires. If the state starts running a surplus, it's reducing everyone else's. And anybody who starts running a surplus is reducing everybody else's, whether it's the federal government, the states, or anybody else. The difference is the federal government is not constrained by revenues. Do you have any questions? All right. Let me say, I think this was very, very interesting. And I Thank both of you, and you all thank you very, very much. Yeah. So I can just take a minute and say thank you very much for everyone who came and engaged. And uh, we have an online website. We're going to have this uh, video up there as soon as possible. We also have a forum, and we're going to make sure that all of the speakers are going to be able to continue answering questions in the future. So if you have any things, you know, a week from now and go, I'm curious about this or something, please go online, please check out the forum, and please use it. It's there to have ongoing access with these people. Thank you.